My name is Jim Sharp, and I'm interviewing uh, John Bly today. We are at the Riley County Courthouse on 3rd Street here in Manhattan, Kansas. And John is a uh, veteran of World War II. And your current address, John, is? 5507 High Meadow Circle. And when were you born? Uh, January the 20th, uh, 1919, at White City. Uh huh. Now, I also should mention that Diane Gate is our camera operator today. Now, uh, tell me where you were born and raised. Well, as I said, I was born in, at White City and uh, raised in that community and until uh, in 1941 when I became a, a county agricultural agent at Morton County out at Elkhart. Now, prior to that, did you go to college? Yes, I went to college and uh, received a degree in uh, the spring of 1940 and had intended to farm, but uh, in 1940 we registered for the draft, not having a real low number, but uh, one that was uh, uh, relatively low. I, I uh, knew that uh, I'd be called to the service sometime. And, uh, in the fall of, of that year, uh, they uh, called and wanted to know if I would be interested in being an uh, extension agent. After visiting with my father, why I decided I would be, and I ended up at Elkhart, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, after that? Well, uh, I, uh, at Elkhart, I had two 4-H clubs. I took some kids to Manhattan to round up in the first of June, and uh, I uh, went over to Marshall Field one day and uh, uh, applied for the uh, Air Force uh, uh, or the Air, Army Air Corps and took the physical. After getting back to Elkhart, I received a letter saying that I uh, had passed a physical and would receive a 90-day notice before they called me to active duty. And uh, long come December 7, and uh, uh, they were calling more people into the uh, service. And on a Saturday, which was January the 3rd, uh, and we worked six days a week back in, that, in those days, and uh, I received a special delivery letter telling me to be at Marshall Field at 8 o'clock Monday morning, uh, the 5th. And I had already intended to go home that weekend, but changed my mind. And uh, instead of leaving right after closing the office, I called Delray and uh, had a last date with her and left about uh, 12 or 1 o'clock and drove to White City and, uh, and was there Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Then where did you go for your initial service? Oh, I, uh, of course, uh, enlisted there at Marshall Field and uh, went to Bakersfield for distribution. And from there, I was sent to uh, Tulare, California for primary flying a, a steerman. And from there, Merced for basic and uh, then on to Luke Field, Arizona, for my advanced training. And following that, uh, Tallahassee, Florida, uh, flying a P-39. Now, what do you remember? Uh, do you have any vivid memories of those uh, boot camp and pilot training and basic training? <clears throat> well, uh, the primary training, of course, uh, is most... Uh, uh, I guess vivid, because um, my first introduction to uh, uh, flying an airplane and uh, by myself, that is solo, I had a good instructor, and I credit him for getting me through pilot's uh, training. But uh, uh, the steerman had a very narrow gear and uh, would ground loop very easy and but I was fortunate I never did uh, ground loop in an airplane. And um, then... Excuse me, but what does that mean? What? What does ground loop mean? Oh, <laughs> it means when you're landing, uh, 
instead of going in a straight line uh, down the runway, it uh, veers off to one side and uh, mm -hmm. and makes a 180 degree turn on you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the process of that, uh, you undoubtedly damage the airplane. Uh, and so uh, you want to be careful of that maneuver. Well, then, was that your last training in the United States? Well, the P-39, uh, and that was a beautiful aircraft, but uh, after you uh, got through describing its beauty, why, you need to quit because uh, uh, it really wasn't a good uh, airplane for combat in the uh, uh, German uh, or the European theater. And it was an airplane that had the motor behind the uh, pilot, and uh, that disrupted the, uh, I guess you'd say, the aerodynamics of the airplane. And uh, if you stalled it out, the airplane, uh, instead of going into a spin, had a tendency uh, uh, to tumble. And getting an airplane in a tumble was difficult to bring it out. And uh, I had a real good friend that went all the way through flying school with uh, and uh, overseas with, and he and I become friends of another young man who was got married as soon as he graduated, and he uh, got the airplane in a tumble and didn't come out. So that was my I guess my first experience, and so it was up to. Uh, uh, my friend Fields and I to go tell his wife that uh, his her husband had been killed. Of course, by the time we got there, and we couldn't leave until uh, they had recovered the body, and, and that took time, and of course he was uh, late getting home, and she knew something had happened. And But uh, we did go give her the official word. So that was uh, my first introduction into, you might say, World War II. Uh -huh. Well, after your pilot training then, uh, what happened? Well, uh, there were, I don't know how many um, pilots of the same um, rank that, that I was, but they selected 30 of us and uh, gave us orders to go to New York. And uh, there... Um, we were in New York for a while waiting for uh, orders or a ship and uh, we uh, eventually boarded a uh, small uh, ship. We, I don't know the name of it, but we found out that that ship was built in 1926 and we were on her maiden crossing. Uh, it had been a pleasure ship down the, uh, in the Bermudas area and, uh, of course, the rumor was at that time that uh, we would join an, a convoy uh, later on. We never did. We landed at Liverpool. And from Liverpool, we uh, were sent to London, where we were billeted in uh, the 30 pilots stayed together and were billeted in uh, private homes next to an airfield. And we were picked up by a bus each morning and taken to the airfield and given a few instructions and uh, and it was a, this airfield that I did uh, fly a hurricane which is British aircraft. That should have given me some indication of what the future might hold for us but uh, it didn't and uh, then we had orders and after about uh, Ten days in London, go back to Liverpool, and there we uh, um, uh, boarded a big troop ship, and uh, that was on our way to North Africa. And that was the invasion of North Africa about uh, the 10th or 12th of uh, November. Okay, and then uh, where did you uh, land in North Africa? We landed, uh, the, uh, the convoy uh, made port in Oran, and these 30 pilots uh, uh, were still together that had come from Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, 
then uh, uh, there wasn't any transportation and we walked about eight miles to the airport and uh, or airfield I guess I should say and uh, there there were some barracks but uh, not any cots or anything and and uh, we did sleep on the cement floor and everybody had one blanket as I recall and uh, then after a couple of days of this why uh, the 30 pilots were assigned to uh, uh, 15 of them to the 31st fighter group and 15 to the uh, 52nd fighter group with three squadrons in each uh, group that made five pilots to each squadron and I was assigned to the 4th squadron 52nd fighter group uh, flying Spitfires. Now <clears throat> should make a mention of that the 52nd and the uh, uh, 31st fighter group had gone overseas in August of 42 and uh, had gone to England and they were on different fields in uh, in England, Ireland and Scotland taking training from the RAF and being checked out in the Spitfire. And the common joke was uh, the British said when these two groups got over there, well if you're going to help us we're going to give you an airplane because uh, the P-40 and the P-39 was no match for the uh, Falkwith 190 or the ME 109. So I had a lot of very good and valuable training with the RAF. And I might say that uh, when we joined the 4th Squadron, those older pilots uh, thought, what do we need these new inexperienced pilots for that we've got to worry about and train? And they did uh, work on us. Uh, uh, not only did we get checked out in a Spitfire, but uh, we uh, went through aircraft identification again and uh, then we were personally uh, quizzed on uh, on uh, how much lead to give an enemy airplane with, at certain angles of flight and certain speeds and uh, we were to learn all of those uh, things uh, uh, real well. Now the, a pilot, one of the original pilots might come up and say uh, you've got an uh, enemy at 8 o'clock high, what do you do? <laughs> and. Uh, so you were supposed to give him the correct answer. And it was, it was good training. Now, uh, was your first combat, where and when? Well, uh, like I say, this was in uh, November and uh, uh, my first combat uh, didn't come until in uh, uh, December or January and of course, uh, new pilot uh, was always a wingman and uh, that's another thing that these older pilots uh, uh, instructed them, uh, the new pilots on <clears throat> the duties of a wingman. He was to uh, watch behind and uh, inform uh, the squadron of any uh, enemy aircraft uh, in the air uh, behind and you might say uh, protect the leader's rear and an old saying was uh, of the leader to his wingman, don't you let me out of your sight and uh, I think I was always a good wingman uh, because uh, I never did lose a leader. So then you went into first combat in uh, January of 42? Of 42 and uh, our missions at that time were uh, fighter sweeps where we'd go out and uh, just look for uh, the uh, enemy and uh, strafe anything that we could see and we usually had as a target a uh, German airfield and uh, we would strafe a German airfield uh, trying to kill uh, uh, 
to uh, destroy any airplanes on the ground. And in that process, you'd usually get some enemy up in the air and end up in a, in a, a little combat. And then other missions were escorting um, bombers. And mostly these were B-25s and B-26s. Although uh, later on in Tunisia, we did escort some B-17s. But in escort mission, uh, your job was uh, to protect those bombers. In other words, it's kind of like uh, playing defense on a, a basketball team. If you can keep them from shooting, why, they won't score. And if you can uh, keep the enemy away from your bombers, well, they won't destroy them. And we were very proud of our record. We never lost a bomber to an enemy aircraft. Now, I could always uh, feel sorry for those bombers as they went on their bomb runs because of those targets usually had a lot of aircraft top fire. And the bombers would actually almost disappear in that black flak over the uh, bomb run. And some of them would come out of that bomb run uh, only flying one engine. And uh, now the B-25s did very well on one engine. Uh, they could stay up with their formation. But a B-26 had difficulty. And uh, so those are the ones that the uh, Germans would be after, would be those uh, lone uh, B-26s, and we'd put uh, uh, six fighters protecting one uh, 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 B-26 or 125 if it happened to fall behind. Well, now, uh, when they were getting all this flack and you were out there protecting it, where were you? <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, I mean, the, the Germans weren't going to attack the, the bombers in the bomb run because uh, of the flak. And uh, so uh, we were briefed on uh, the uh, bomb run, uh, the direction they'd make the run, and where the, uh, the bomb run was. And uh, we'd pull off the side. And, of course, that was up to the squadron uh, uh, leader, uh, whoever was leading. Now, I might say, although there were more pilots in a squadron, we flew in 12 missions. When we went out, we flew uh, 12 ship missions. And uh, uh, depending on our losses, uh, well, we'd run anywhere from 16 to 30 pilots in a squadron. But uh, if we lost a lot of pilots before we got some new pilots in, uh, at one time, I remember we were down to uh, about uh, 15 or 16 pilots. Sounds like you're pretty lucky. I was very fortunate. Were you ever hit? Uh, I was never hit uh, by an enemy uh, aircraft, although uh, on s several occasions I had uh, um, uh, damage from flak. And on uh, some occasions just a, a, a few little hits in the wing but uh, on three occasions, I had quite a bit of damage, and one, cons I, which I would call, call considerable damage, uh, holes in both wings, and uh, and uh, but uh, never did hit any of the uh, control uh, lines uh, or hydraulic lines. So uh, I was able to fly the airplane. Every time I was able to get it back. But on this particular time, uh, uh, I could see those holes in the wings, and I was sure that one of my tires had been shot out. But the wheels uh, uh, come down all right and locked, and so uh, I was able to land the airplane. And uh, But uh, after I landed, I found out I did have a, a blown-out tire, and uh, I had to be towed to a parking place uh, uh, and uh, crew chief went on park My crew chief was always there and climb up on the wind, wing and his first question was how are you and uh, 
So uh, I reported that I was just fine, didn't have a scratch. And he, But I said, I think I brought some work home to you. He said, yeah. And he says, and that tail doesn't look very good either. Now, I didn't know the tail was shot up that bad, but um, they had to replace both tail, both wings and uh, and tail in the airplane. But uh, we had good mechanics, and they had the ship back flying in uh, just a few days. But he said to me, he said, well, if you didn't get a Purple Heart, he says, I think we need to give the airplane one. Well, you mentioned the P-39 didn't match up well with the German ME-109. Now, how did those Spitfires match up? Well, uh, Germans, both the 109 and the Falkwolf, uh, could outrun us and outclimb us, but uh, we could outturn them. And especially to the right, uh, because of the torque in an airplane, uh, and that's one thing I remember from my uh, experience and that was one of the things that we were taught when we first joined the uh, the uh, uh, squadron if possible why well, it turn to the right but there's sometimes when you uh, uh, it's not impossible I mean it's not possible to turn to the right uh, you have to turn to the left if they're coming in to you from your left you have to turn into them but we could uh, out turn uh, the uh, uh, 109, especially the Falkwolf, was really a better airplane, and uh, and we could uh, match up very well with uh, in the maneuverability of uh, the 109. Now I know from uh, news items that you had uh, been involved in some pretty heavy combat and shot down at least one enemy. Well, uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, we had uh, several engagements, and uh, but uh, we had a very strict rule in our squadron uh, or in our group, really, that you couldn't con uh, claim a victory unless it was confirmed by some other pilot. Well, you can imagine in air combat, everybody's a little busy. To, uh, instead of just watching to see who in the heck uh, uh, hits the ground. And um, so uh, uh, a lot of times it was difficult to confirm uh, the victories. And there was I had one confirmed victory, and there were two others that, uh, uh, in my own mind, I confirmed them, <laughs> yeah. but uh, they were not confirmed. Then there were several others where uh, uh, you could see damage on the airplane. Now, Spitfire was equipped with two 20 millimeter cannons and four 30 uh, caliber machine guns. And the uh, uh, cannons were loaded with, a, a, I can't remember the sequence, but a high explosive and armor piercing and uh, tracer bullets. And uh, uh, you can see uh, those uh, hits by the 20 millimeter cannon. Uh, and I would observe some of those and was positive that I did considerable damage. But, uh, I weren't able to stay with the airplane long enough to confirm that it was shot down. And then, as I said before, and this was true practically all through uh, the African campaign. I was a wingman, and uh, my job was to uh, watch after my leader and uh, see and st stick with him. And uh, so, if you had a few quick shots, uh, I you pulled away and, and and looked for your leader again. And well, now. Uh were these two unconfirmed and one confirmed? Were these ME 109s or what kind of? They were 109s, uh -huh. yes. Okay, now we're still in Oran? Well, no. Uh, we, uh, uh, we didn't stay in Oran. We moved right away uh, uh, inland into uh, Algeria. And I can't name the bases, 
but uh, between Oran and, and Constantine, which was another prominent city in, uh, in Algeria, uh, we moved to several bases because uh, in some of them we only stayed a couple of weeks. Uh, it was necessary for us to stay close to the lines because of our limited uh, uh, fuel supply. If we were on a mission uh, for an hour and 15 minutes, uh, that was a long mission and we were likely to be very low on fuel. Then there was one time when uh, uh, um, my leader, who at that time was a, a pilot by the name of uh, Captain Kelly, uh, got separated from the rest of the squadron in, in a skirmish that I guess you'd say we had. And uh, we're headed back to the base, or our field, and uh, uh, as we were, uh, our airplanes were, had a desert camouflage, and if you flew down next to the ground, we were a little hard to see uh, from the air, and we were right down on top of the ground, and as we come up over a hill, I was lined up uh, on uh, some sort of troops. Well, I was positive as I took a glance at them that they were uh, enemy, because I didn't think we had Americans there. And uh, so I opened fire on them and uh, hit some men and, uh, and, uh, and some vehicles. Well, uh, Kelly, uh, was disappointed. I know that he didn't. He was flying out to the side of me, and uh, he wouldn't line up for this uh, encampment, so to speak. And so he said, "Let's turn around." So we whipped it around, went back through him again, and then of course we had to come back through him again. And I was afraid he was going to do it again. <laughs> and I said, "Kelly, I'm about out of gas." And I said. Uh, I think we better go home, and so we did. Well, and I was about out of gas. But uh, you always wonder whether you're shooting up your own troops. Momentarily, I was positive that we weren't, and uh, but it made us feel a lot better. The next evening, when uh, uh, a broadcaster from Bizerti, and we named her Gertie from Bizerti, and uh, she uh, spoke in po perfect English and uh, played uh, uh, American songs and always uh, some uh, 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 comment about, don't you boys wish you were home and uh, with your families and wives. And, and, uh, but we, we tuned her in every night. But uh, the next night, she, uh, on her broadcast, told about these terrible American pilots flying Spitfires that shot up uh, some poor defensive uh, Italians. So it made us feel a lot better. I understand you had uh, some relationship with the Tuskegee Airmen, that oh, black pilots? Yes, uh, they just come overseas and, uh, you know, most of our squadron uh, were just like me. I didn't have any idea what segregation was like, and uh, I don't know who uh, uh, started it, but I give credit to our squadron CO, because remembering uh, the training they had from the RAF, I think he uh, uh, had some feelings for uh, uh, this 99th squadron, which come over, and uh, so... Uh, he contacted them, and we went over and had lunch with them. And I might say we were eating outside, and they had a tent uh, for their mess hall. And so we enjoyed a sit-down meal with them. And then uh, uh, we talked to them and briefed them on, on what they might expect. And then we went out and flew a mission with them. Well, we didn't hit anything in that mission, which was kind of the intention anyway. Uh, but we went out and uh, and flew around for a while, come back and and uh, visit with them some more. And then we went to our field, and about a week later, why uh, we went over and did that again. 
And I was fortunate that, uh, and it was probably because of my leader went, uh, that I got to go. But uh, as I said, uh, we only flew 12 ship missions and we had more pilots than that. And, uh, but um, uh, this 99th, um, we're flying P-40s, which wasn't any match for the German aircraft. And uh, they had uh, bad experience not only because of that, because because of their inexperience. And uh, they went home, and of course they were training more black airmen, and uh, they come back, I, I don't know when, but uh, then they were stationed in uh, Italy uh, flying P-51s. This would be after I come home, and they had a tremendous record uh, as a... Uh, uh, group, but uh, and I thought that uh, some of them should mention the 99th, which took this I thought terrible beating when they first come over, and uh, some of them were able to survive. And the highlight of that is that uh, during the dole uh, 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 dedication of the buildings, they had two of these uh, black uh, Tuskegee airmen there and one of them the paper had said uh, uh, was in the original 99th so uh, I uh, talked to him after the program and visited and he said he remembered when we come over flying the Spitfires and and flying a mission with him so I enjoyed that. So then uh, the African campaign is winding down yeah, I, I, I don't know what the date of the end of that was, but uh, I think uh, 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 May the 11th uh, was when the uh, African campaign was over. Then where were you assigned? Well, we were on a field in between Tunis and Bizzurdi, and uh, uh, those were the two main ports in Tunisia. and. Uh, in fact, it was a build-up uh, place for the invasion into to Sicily. And while I was there, a couple of interesting things uh, happened. Uh, um, Churchill and King George uh, uh, landed on our field, but I might say I was so far away that I didn't see them, uh, except was told that they were there. But then uh, Eisenhower uh, visited our squadron. Uh, he and a couple of uh, colonels come in and and it just happened that uh, we were uh, 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 on alert that day and now alert means that uh, you had two people strapped in the airplane ready, ready to take off uh, if you shot a flare and then uh, able to put up 12 more airplanes within uh, four minutes and uh, so we were all out on, on the flight line, so to speak, and Eisenhower come, and our squadron CO introduced him to uh, each one of the pilots. Well, he was asking about every fourth pilot, uh, 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 who they, uh, where they were from, and he uh, asked me, and I said, White City, Kansas. I said, that's about 40 miles from Abilene and between uh, Harrington Junction City and Council Grove. And he said, oh, he said, I had a letter from the Harrington Chamber of Commerce congratulating us on our African victory. And I know very well that letter congratulated him on his African victory, but he said congratulating us on our African victory. Mm -hmm. Well, we had a nice visit. He asked me about the folks, how the crops were, and, uh, and uh, everything, and so, uh, he went on down the line, and then I might say, we had two boys uh, that had just joined our squ squadron uh, shortly before there, and they were staff sergeant pilots. This was a rank that they gave uh, uh, to uh, boys that finished uh, pilot training that just had a high school graduate, uh, high school uh, diploma. Now, when I got in, you had to either pass a real tough uh, mental exam which they said nobody could pass or have two years of college. And 
they made these boys staff uh, uh, sergeant pilots. Well, our squadron didn't like that and tried to uh, promote them right away to second lieutenant. Orders come back, you can't promote a staff to second lieutenant. So they just decided to make uh, warrant officers out of them. Well, those orders hadn't come back yet. And this one uh, kid, looked I know he was 18, but he looked like he was 16 and small. And uh, we kid him about not having any rank. And he said, I don't have any rank. I'm just a fighting son of a bitch. <laughs> so when our CO got down to these two boys, he said, and this is Mr. Montgomery. And Eisenhower looked down at him and said, son, what's your rank? He looked up at him and said, sir, I don't have any rank. I'm just a fighting son of a bitch. <laughs> well, I might say Montgomery got shot down and killed when we were um, in Corsica. So uh, he was a heck of a good pilot and a good kid. But uh, we lost a lot of boys like that. Now, after the African campaign, where were you? We, uh, we went to Sicily and were there at Palermo. And there we uh, enjoyed our first barracks. Uh, we took over Italian barracks. We had a, a mess hall and barracks for the enlisted men and barracks for the uh, officers. When then in furnishings, but uh, uh, we'd been overseas long enough that, uh, that some of the fellows uh, just went out on the street and got a truck and, uh, and went to a hotel and and uh, got some furnishings for us and, and enough uh, uh, liquor to stock a bar both in the enlisted men's off, uh, quarters and the officers' quarters. And, uh, and it had a nice garden out around it. And, uh, and I might say that, that it was in Sicily that, uh, that uh, I, like everybody else, complained about the mess. And I finally went to the squadron CO and I said, uh, I've complained enough. I said, if you want, I'll take over the mess uh, duties. And uh, so he was glad to do that because it, uh, it had just been one of the officers out of the uh, headquarters of our uh, uh, squadron. And uh, the first thing I did was to go to talk to them and find out what they needed. Well, with mechanics, they could build anything they needed. And so uh, I got a hold of uh, one of the master sergeants and said, came in and, and let him talk to the mass sergeant. I said, this is what the boys need. And they had it in just a few days. And then uh, lying about our su needed supplies and one thing or another, the quartermaster, uh, why we had adequate supplies. And it wasn't long till a, a, a new pilot come around and said uh, to me when I was in the kitchen, he said, why don't you fix spam this way? And gosh, he uh, knew what he was talking about. And I said, well, talk to the cooks. So I went to CO and I said, I found my replacement. This boy uh, was from Boston and his family had been in the restaurant business. And uh, he said, well, he wouldn't uh, take over mess uh, uh, officer but he would be the assistant. So he looked after the kitchen, and I looked after the order and the supplies. This went on for a while until he got enough experience, he did the whole thing, which I was glad to give to him. So then you went back to being a pilot? Well, I was a pilot all the time. Oh, and, oh yeah, no, I, that was just in, in addition to, no, that didn't take much time. Uh, go in and visit with a, a mess sergeant, uh, maybe 30 minutes a day, and, and, uh, and he and I would make out the, the uh, orders for food, and, uh, and uh, it, all they needed was a little encouragement, and, uh, and I guess <laughs> sympathy for what they were doing, because uh, it was a thankless job most of the time. Was that a pretty tough duty there in Sicily as far as the Germans uh, uh Competition from no, the Germans uh, combat. There, we were to protect the harbor of uh, of uh, Palermo, and, and uh, while uh, the fighting was still going on, we did fly uh, some ground support uh, uh, missions. 
but uh, it was nothing like the African campaign. The African campaign, but uh, I might say there, uh, we uh, uh, were uh, transferred to the another Air Force and we were called, our missions were called operational missions instead of combat missions. They were the same things, but uh, they just called operational missions. And uh, then from uh, we'll hurry along, uh, after uh, being in Sicily for a while, uh, we went to Italy uh, for a, a, about 10 days. But it was rainy weather and the fields were muddy and, and uh, really didn't have any good air f strip for us. And so we were sent to Corsica. And I might say that while I was in Italy, uh, we were close to Naples, which is close to um, um, Pompeii and Vesuvius. And uh, some of us did take uh, uh, a little trip over to Pompeii. And I happened to see uh, uh, Pompeii on the news, uh, uh, what is Discovery's Channel, I think, the other night. And it's just like all uh, resort and uh, uh, places now. You hardly could recognize it, but uh, Pompeii was quite a city. Had running water uh, in lead pipes, and they were still there, and, and uh, had uh, uh, rock-paved uh, streets. And uh, so uh, it, uh, it was interesting then. And I might say that when we were in Sicily, that was... Uh, uh, of course, you know the stronghold of the Mafia, and we were warned when we got to uh, Palermo never to go down to town in cars, at least in groups of four, and uh, be armed and uh, not uh, get intoxicated, at least have somebody look after you. And um, so, uh, and we did have and, uh, uh, soldiers being killed. Uh, putting her every night. Well, Patton was back in uh, Palermo then with his headquarters, and uh, having uh, a bar in our uh, 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 quarters, we uh, had some company from uh, other uh, groups. And one night we had uh, some officers from the MPs come in, and they told us about uh, their CO being called in by Patton, and. Uh, uh, dressed down for not take, uh, taking care of the uh, uh, disturbances in Palermo. And he, he dismissed him and then called him back and uh, said, I wasn't going to tell you how to solve this. But he said the next time, he said, you have any problem? He says, Sh shoot into those. And he says, shoot to kill. He said, uh, take the wounded to the hospital. He said, leave the, uh, the uh, dead on the street put a guard on them for 24 hours. Well, it happened I was downtown and I saw two civilians laying in the street with an MP at the, a foot and ahead of each one of them. And uh, they didn't leave them lay for 24 hours. I understood they picked them up at sundown and uh, gave them to their families or somebody. Mm -hmm. But uh, after that, uh, the civilians saluted everything in a United States Air, uh, uniform. And now, I know, oh, excuse me, go ahead. I know the situation is different now, uh, but uh, I, uh, Patton took care of it right away, and he was one of my f uh, favorite generals. Now, uh, we need to get on the record your name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> Well, that was one of the things that was uh, that we were stressed on us in our censorship. We were not to give out any information, and name was John Kermit Blythe, and uh, of course would be my current rank, and uh, uh, seven two seven three nine two, and uh, was serial number. And Your current rank is well uh, now. Uh, I was discharged as a major. Now, okay. from active service, uh, 5th of November of 45, and then, uh, uh, gosh, uh, uh, Jim, I haven't looked at this. Uh, uh, I went to some reunions, and I picked up some histories, but I didn't even look at it until I found out.
coming down here. I put all of that out of my mind. And uh, so after 60 years, uh, <laughs> in 84 years, <laughs> your memory isn't all that good. I do want to, uh, I mean, you've had a more, much more uh, combat experience here, and I don't want to leave that yet. So let's, uh, after Italy. Oh, uh, after Italy, we went to Corsica. And there in Corsica, uh, group headquarters are, were on one side of the island and, and uh, our squadron on the other. And uh, they put bomb racks on our airplanes, and we... Uh, Started out flying with 250-pound bombs, but then found out we could get off the ground with uh, uh, 500s, and we carried 500s, and we bombed uh, shipping, uh, oil uh, uh, supplies, roads, bridges, and uh, I thought we were pretty good at that time. We'd go in at about 12,000 feet, roll over, and dive down, and uh, uh, and sight in on the target and uh, and uh, uh, then pull out and uh, go for home. But uh, we'd look back and see what we hit. But then in the, seeing the Gulf War and seeing the precision of the bombing, <laughs> it makes you think that uh, uh, we were just messing around then. All right. Uh what, what was the next step in that process? You're in Corsica. Okay, uh, I thought I was coming home in February and got started home. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, they had established a training facilities for Spitfires uh, uh, in North Africa. And uh, being a captain and with uh, so this experience, why uh, my orders were changed and I was sent to a fighter training squad uh, uh, center. And I knew that we were to get P-51s. In fact, that's a story that still sticks in my mind. We were to get P-51s in January of 44. Didn't get them till April. North American went on a strike during the war. And that really disturbed me. And they, Hap Arnold finally went out and begged them to go back to work. And uh, they finally went back to work and we got our spits in, uh, I mean our 51s in, uh, in April. Well, in that period of time, the British didn't give us spit nines, uh, which was a better aircraft. We had to go back to flying the old spit five. And in the meantime, the Germans had put an inline engine in their Falk Wolf, had souped up the 109s, and so we were no match for the new uh, uh, 109 or new uh, Falk Wolfs and uh, 109s. And so I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for people striking, and especially not in wartime. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what happens next? Oh well. Then, uh, and I knew we were getting to P-51s uh, because I had word that, uh, that we'd gotten a few. So I sent word back with one of the fellows that we had trained I, with a message to my squadron commander. I said, get me out of here. I said, I want uh, transferred back to the squadron. Well, I did get transferred back to the squadron, and then uh, I did check out in a 51. All I did was just fly it around the field, and it is a whale of a good airplane. And, uh, so then uh, I ended up with orders to come home. So then where were you on uh, VE Day 1944? Oh, I was board ship uh, on uh, J uh, June the 6th, uh, 1944, coming home. What happened after that? Where did you Well, I landed at Newport News uh, in uh, Virginia, and uh, there I had to take a troop train to uh, uh, St. Louis, and from there uh, uh, get a uh, train to Kansas City. Delray was in Kansas City, and I called her. Of course, I had already written to her and told her I was coming home, and I said, uh, 
you buy the ring. I'd already <laughs> g given her the engagement ring, and I told her, you uh, uh, you buy the rings, and uh, we're going to get married as soon as we get home. Well, we got married uh, uh, June the 25th, 44. And yeah. we got married in White City because that was the thing that was most convenient for me. Then uh, how long were you in the service after that? Well, uh, that was uh, June of 44, and I uh, was uh, separated from active duty, uh, I think it was November the 5th of uh, 45. Now, before we leave the, your military service, is there anything else that maybe you think about that I haven't asked you about that you might want to tell us about? Well, <clears throat> I went to a freight of Washington, and there I flew a P-63, which is just a, a overgrown P-39, just as but just as pretty. And uh, then uh, I checked out in a P-38, and uh, that's a good airplane, too. Uh, and uh, I'm glad I got to fly, fly that. And uh, I guess the only thing that, uh, of course, you understand uh, in a fighter aircraft, when you uh, solo that, you're all by yourself. Uh, you don't have any uh, training flight. Uh, so they stand on the wing and or on the ground and, and check you out. And, uh, of course, you have to sit in the cockpit and learn how to learn where all the instruments are and uh, blindfold, blindfolded point to them and all of that. And I guess an experience that I had in uh, Afreda, uh really was uh, uh, kind of unusual. Uh, we, I didn't have any aerial gunnery before I went overseas. The first aerial gunnery I had was at a 109. And uh, so... Uh, I went, we were going to Daggett Field, California for first air, aerial gunning from Elkhart. And I hadn't been uh, there very long, and so uh, uh, all of the uh, older pilots uh, got to fly an airplane down to Daggett to go by train. Then they started looking through rank, and uh, the person with the most rank was the train commander. I was a trained commander. <laughs> well, boy, I didn't know anything. And, uh, of course, uh, I had somebody in charge of all the officers, and, and they were in one car, and the enlisted men were all in another. But uh, this uh, master sergeant come up and uh, introduced himself, and he said, uh, I'm in charge of all of the enlisted men. And uh, and he said, is everything ready to go? And I said, gosh, I don't know. And he said, did you know you don't have a mess kitchen? I said, no, I don't know that. And uh, he said, uh, well, he said, uh, don't leave uh, this station without a mess kitchen. Well, I saw the transportation officer, and he said, well, you'll pick a mess kitchen up down the road. Well, this mess sergeant was right with me. I mean, this master sergeant was right with me. And so uh, uh, he said to me, he says, uh, don't leave without a mess or uh, without a kitchen. And uh, so I said, well, I think we've got to have a kitchen. And uh, so uh, uh, then they, he got me aside and he said, he said, uh, as far as this troop train uh, goes, he said, you outrank the base commander. <laughs> and so I said, oh, <laughs> And I went back to that old phrase that we had in there when I was a wingman. I said to this sergeant, I said, don't let me out of your sight. <laughs> and so he stuck with me. And uh, and we went to the transportation officer, and he still wasn't going to give me one. I said, well, maybe we better end this conversation in the base commander's office. Well, then they got busy, and they got us a, a, a mask kitchen and full supplies, and, uh, and we were on our way to California. So that was an experience that was other than flying, and uh, it was certainly new for me. Uh, before we leave your military, I note you have a couple photos over there. Would you like to comment on those or well, any other memorabilia that you have? 
Well, this is uh, on the field uh, in between Tunis and Bizerti. And I told you about being on alert and uh, how we had the airplanes lined up. And, of course, we don't show uh, a couple of the airplanes that are ready to take off, but there's uh, two, five airplanes there. And I think uh, we had about six or eight of them lined up there. And what we were doing was run out there and uh, jump in, and, and a crew chief would be right there, too, and uh, get the airplane started. And we'd take off and get our instructions in the air. And uh, so, uh, and then this is a picture I had taken when I was younger. That's uh, when I graduated from uh, flight school. Uh, J uh, July 26, 1942. Mm -hmm. Then uh, give us a date. I believe you told us when you were discharged, but where was the place? Oh, uh, uh, I went to Fort Leavenworth, uh, and uh, of course I had a lot of leave. I was in the service for uh, 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 all this time, and the only official leave I had was a seven-day leave uh, in, I guess, B-44. 40, uh, and uh, when I come home. And so I had about 100 days of leave. My uh, official discharge or separation was November the 5th. And then... 1944. And then I was in the reserve, and uh, I uh, was separated finally um, what um, in 53 I guess yeah April 53 and what's that date represent oh, oh discharge my discharge was in From, April of 53 yeah mm -hmm. okay and well, um, now I see what's June of 14th of 1944, that would have been after your discharge that you landed in Newport News, Virginia? Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, June the 14th of 44 is uh, when I uh, landed in, uh, and then got married, and I wasn't discharged until 45. Okay. 45. If I said 44, I yeah. misspoke. Okay, now I want to get into your post-military. We just got a brief amount of time here, but I want to briefly tell us about post-military, your marriage, and your family. Well, as I say, I got married, and, and when I got out of the service, why, uh, uh, we uh, went to the farm at uh, Parkerville, Kansas, and uh, I was active in, uh, in uh, many activities, the Livestock Association, Kansas Farm Bureau, and the extension service. In fact, Delray was on the extension board uh, in uh, Morris County. But uh, then, uh, because of my interest in Farm Bureau, why they asked me to come work for uh, uh, the uh, policy de uh, uh, department of Farm Bureau and uh, legislative department. And so I worked for Farm Bureau for 21 years. How about children? Got three children, uh, two girls and a boy, uh, uh, and they're all in the Kansas City area. Uh, Holly and and uh, and Jana were both teachers, and Jerry works in a bank. So, uh, is there anything else that we've missed? That we've got four grandchildren. Well, yeah, I guess that's pretty important, isn't it? <laughs> and two of them are married, and uh, one's a freshman in college here at Manhattan, and the uh, youngest is a, fr uh, a freshman in high school in Kansas City. Well, uh, so is there anything else that you might uh, briefly speak about? Uh, well... Sixty years is a long time. <laughs> yes. Well, you've done a good job, and we appreciate you coming in and telling us about your very interesting experiences. And uh, as sort of a little payback for you and your family, we've made a tape for you, or will shortly, that we will give you 
as sort of a memento of this uh, interview. So, Well, thank you.